I'm Associate Dean Lisa Skank at the Law School. Um, I'm the Program Director for National Security Law. I welcome you all to our second um, in a series of leadership and lawyers. Uh, many of you attended last year when we had uh, General Petraeus here uh, with General Martins to do a discussion on leadership and the role of attorneys in the field. This is sort of a follow-on, at least um, Jeremy, Pam, and I have discussed engaging in these events. And today, we are very lucky to have an entire panel uh, from West Point, uh, the Academy, the United States Military Academy. And they're all professors or have been professors. They, um, I'll go over a little bit of each of their contributions as Jeremy and I have talked about who we want on this panel. And the bios in the, in the book don't really, in the program, don't really give you a full sense of the accomplishments of these panel members. We uh, were restricted to space, so you should Google, as of course you Google everyone. When you leave, you'll see the, these, these panel members are very modest. They're not going to tell you their accomplishments. They're going to talk to you about the role of lawyers and leadership uh, and judgment, how uh, you get that with experience and, of course, training, and that's what they do. So on the panel today, we have Brigadier General Retired Mike Meese. He's the former um, head of the Social Sciences Department, uh, aside from all his degrees and everything like that. I, I met Mike Meese when he was my husband's boss in the Social Department, and uh, he was getting his PhD at Princeton. Um, He's a genius. In addition to being a genius, uh, uh, I was going to say Professor Meese, General Meese was called from West Point to assist General Petraeus both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. So he's been in the field quite a bit as a senior advisor to General Petraeus, who, who you met last, and um, he'll, he'll tell you about his role in that. Um, the Social Sciences Department teaches econ as well, so he's also got that business background. Um, we have Colonel Spann. Colonel Spann is actually uh, the head of the department at West Point that teaches leadership. It's called BSNL. Some cadets call it BS and lies, but that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> so they teach leadership. Cadets have to learn leadership. And Colonel Spann, of course, is... Um, We'll talk to you about how they Im embed that judgment and leadership s uh, skills to the to the cadets. Uh, Colonel Spann also was deployed in Iraq, and he um, also worked with special forces at, at Fort Bragg. And he's a line officer. So both these uh, esteemed panel members are are not attorneys. Um, then we have on the other end of the table we have two attorneys, two JAG. Uh, lawyers, Army Jacks, uh, Shane Reeves, Lieutenant Colonel Shane Reeves, are you the acting department head of law or are you the not head? I, I am not, no longer the acting. So you're the, the deputy, so he's the deputy head. department head of the Department of Law. We call them the not head <laughs> because they're not the head. And um, I met Shane when he was a cadet and um, he wanted to be called Sundance. That's what he wrote on his bio sheet. And he also wrote on his bio sheet that he used to wear a ponytail. So here he is. He did get the highest grade in all my sections of constitutional and military law, uh, a B plus. <laughs> and um, he is now, he was the acting department head, but, but Shane started out as a line officer. So he can give you the perspectives of uh, people in the field, uh, service members, officers who serve and then switch to be JAGs. The Army paid for him to go to law school at William Mary. He was prior services. He was prior, prior, he was formally serving as an armor officer. And he also, he served in Iraq as a JAG, as I recall. And his, uh, I recall this because I was on the court in, in my nice cushy office and on, on active duty. And Shane emailed me from Iraq. <clears throat> I don't know if he remembers this and it said, Ma'am, I don't recall, you know, I always wanted to have your career path. I don't recall uh, this happening to you, but I was sitting at a meeting my first day in Iraq, and my first words were incoming. <laughs> I don't remember that being in your vocabulary. <laughs> so that's why, it doesn't say in his bio, but I'm 
I'm sure he served in Iraq as an attorney. So, um, And then at the end, we have one of your alumni. We have Major Akala. He is um, teaching at West Point, and he's a JAG. I believe you're, you're a direct commissionee. He's a direct commissionee, so many of our students and some of our students out there have been selected for the Army JAG Corps. Uh, those are folks that apply uh, for the Army as three L's and they get uh, selected to the Army JAG Corps. And now he's teaching at West Point, um, and he, he can talk to you. With, those of you who want to speak with him after, he'll also be available to talk about how, how he applied and got selected for the JAG Corps. So that's our panel. Um, our moderator today is going to be Jeremy Pam. He's, of course, a professor of lecture in law, director of uh, the business finance uh, program. And he actually was an intelligence officer prior to going to law school in the Air Force. So he's a little weaker than the panel. These are Army guys. He's an Air Force guy. Intelligence officer. Uh, he also has a bazillion degrees. And he also was a, a finance diplomat who served um, he also he served for the Treasury Department and he served for the State Department and he was also in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I'm going to turn that over to him and uh, hope you hope you enjoy the lunch anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Skank, uh, and uh, welcome to our panelists and welcome to our guests. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief uh, introduction and uh, then we'll turn it over to the panel for their brief introductions and with the goal of getting to Q&A as quickly as possible. This event today is part of the uh, an ongoing series as uh, Lisa mentioned. Um, in the business and finance law program we refer to it as the business leadership and judgment series. Uh, the simple idea behind that series is that in addition to the role that we're familiar with as experts in the law, lawyers also need to, to learn how to demonstrate practical wisdom in judgment as part of being prepared to exercise leadership. That may sound old-fashioned, perhaps outdated, but actually it still captures something that is distinct, important, and an underappreciated component of leadership, including leadership as lawyers. The concept of wisdom, or practical wisdom, is distinct from expertise. Not only knowing the rational answer to a question, that's the expertise part, but being able to interpret ambiguous situations, often characterized by high uncertainty uh, and multiple rules or values in play. This is important because practicing lawyers are valued not only for knowing the right answer in the abstract, but for advising on the wise course of action in a particular situation. It's a key component of leadership because as lawyers advance in their careers, it's this second function of wise judgment that clients and indeed society, as I think some of our panelists will, will address, have historically looked to, among others, the best of experienced practicing lawyers to provide. It's a longer story that we won't go into here, but there's a certain intuitive sense in society looking to practicing lawyers to be sources of practical wisdom. Uh, and when wise judgment is required more broadly than on legal questions, to look to lawyers to serve as leaders in roles beyond the law narrowly defined. This is a, an old pattern, uh, not only in American society, but in many societies around the world looking to lawyers not only for legal judgment, but for broader, wise judgment. However, the challenge for us here in law school is that even if there's a general appreciation that excellent lawyers must possess practical wisdom in exercising judgment, because we're talking not about expertise, but about practical wisdom, which is traditionally associated with experience in practice, how can it be taught? This is where our distinguished panel today comes in. One U.S. institution that regards leadership and judgment as sufficiently important to devote significant effort to teaching it is the U.S. military. Above and beyond that, our panelists today, as you have already heard from Dean Skank, are four U.S. Army officers and members, or in Mike Meese's case, former members of the faculty of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, who not only teach leadership by merit of their position training future military officers, but also possess and teach academic expertise in specific disciplines. As you've heard, Major Alcala is a lawyer and law professor in the law department. 
Um, in addition to his JD and BA in history and classics, which I think is, is quite relevant to this discussion of practical wisdom, which of course goes back to Aristotle's concept of phrenesis, uh, uh, Ron Alcala has an MA in Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Mike Meese, uh, sorry, going, going next to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Shane Reeves, he's, he, he, as you've heard, he's an associate professor and, and deputy head of the Department of Law. In addition to his JD from William and Mary, he has an LLM in military law from the Judge Advocate General School. Colonel Everett Spain is, as you've heard, professor and head of the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership. I'm not sure Lisa defined BSNL, but that's actually what it stands for, Behavioral <laughs> Sciences and Leadership. So the social sciences, uh, uh, other than the social sciences taught in uh, Mike Meese's uh, social department. Um, and you, you've heard uh, about some of Colonel Spain's assignments, but let me mention uh, just two back-to-back -back assignments, which uh, I think are particularly uh, relevant to, to the discussion today and to, uh, to, to my particular perspective uh, from the business and finance program. In uh, circa 2008, he, as a White House fellow, he served in the Treasury Department during the transition year from the George, H, the George W. Bush administration to the Obama administration, which coincided, as you may remember, distantly, with the financial crisis and in the Treasury Department, he was acting Deputy Chief Operating Officer of the Office of Financial Stability, which was responsible for managing the TARP fund, uh, which was crucial to the response to the financial crisis. Colonel Spain came to that assignment after having just served as aide-de-camp aide to one of our previous speakers here, to General Petraeus, when he was uh, commanding general of the multinational force Iraq in. Uh, in Baghdad. So he went from uh, uh, one type of crisis in Iraq directly into another type of crisis, a financial crisis here in Washington. And uh, finally, to uh, 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 my immediate left, uh, Brigadier General Mike Meese uh, was head of the Social Sciences Department uh, uh, for a long time at West Point, and uh, as, as Lisa mentioned uh, in, in brief, one of the key things about it is that Mike was one of the people responsible as head of the Social Sciences Department for mobilizing the U.S. Army's best and brightest to assist the most senior officers in the most challenging missions. And I encountered many uh, in that category uh, um, who, uh, who were ex made extraordinary contributions. And that best and brightest does not exclude Mike himself, who, as his bio notes, um, ended up spending nearly three years um, deployed um, in strategic um, uh, uh, and line positions uh, in, in combat theaters. And, Mike has an MA, an MPA, and a PhD from Princeton. So having established, I hope, both their uh, extraordinary military credentials and their extraordinary uh, academic credentials, let me just uh, uh, say what, uh, how this came about, uh, how this event came about, and the, and the, the questions we posed to them. Uh, Essentially, we, this came out of initially a conversation that Mike Meese and I had about the requirements for future leaders uh, looking out uh, to 2030 and beyond. And uh, the, 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 the questions we ended up posing for the panel's uh, uh, sort of initial response were two. One, from your perspe respective perspectives as educators in particular disciplines and military leaders, how do you think of the importance of judgment and leadership by comparison with the disciplines of your respective departments? Law, law, behavioral sciences and leadership, and social sciences. What's missing from teaching law or the behavioral sciences or social sciences alone? And second, from your respective perspectives, how do you try to convey to the relatively young and inexperienced students slash cadets what good leadership and judgment is and why it is at least as important as the more straightforward academic content for which you also have responsibility? So I will leave it at that. Um, let me give a disclaimer. Uh, if, if it will work for, for the whole panel, I'll give the standard disclaimer that the views expressed here are our panelists' personal views and do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of Defense, the United States Army, the United States Military Academy, or any other department or agency of the United States government. The analysis presented here stems from their academic research of publicly available resources, not from any protected operational information. So hopefully they don't have to say that. And with that, I will turn it over first to Mike Meese. Thank you.
Thank, thank you very much, Jeremy. It's an honor to be here. I was here for the session with General uh, Petraeus and Mark Martins, which uh, we're humbled to be able to follow in that. And again, remembering from that session, most of the fun was in the questions, so we'll try to get through our uh, opening things to tee up some questions you might think about. It's great being with Jeremy in a much more comfortable environment than either Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, and it's great to be here with Lisa Schenk. Um, she not only taught in the law department, but she was in the head of administrative law. Uh, in the social sciences department, we tended to color slightly outside the lines. And uh, Lisa was in charge of drawing those lines. So uh, again, it's a much more comfortable environment being here uh, uh, without you having to tell us that we're uh, <coughs> doing something wrong in the social department. <laughs> Um, what I'm going to do is set up kind of the broader context and then pass it to my colleagues that are lawyers to dive into some of the specifics with regard to the law and technology and national security elements and then Everett's going to talk about a little bit more about the uh, broader leadership. And when I think about these issues for those of us that are in the military and thinking about it here in a law school, the key connection about uh, the relationship between the theoretical learning and the practical wisdom and the, why we rely on lawyers is really because both the military and the lawyers are, are being trained in addition to being educated in your subject matter but being trained to be part of a profession. All of you and all of the military cadets that are being uh, developed at West Point are going to enter a profession where they need to apply the specific theoretical knowledge in increasingly ambiguous situations where they will learn more and more practical wisdom as they increase in responsibility. What I'm going to do is lay out some of the key aspects of that profession that officers and lawyers are in um, as a profession entrusted by society, uh, both lawyers, the military, the other key professions that you think of, the medical profession, as well as the clergy, have significant discretion to develop, create, maintain, and enforce a body of specialized knowledge, and then apply that specialized knowledge according to those professional standards. Military officers must do things right. That's the theoretical knowledge that Jeremy talked about. But they need to be able to do the right things. And that's kind of the practical knowledge that they think of. The way that we transmit that to the cadets up at West Point and all officials in government is through the oath of office. And when you think about it, the commissioning oath, which is the last thing right before the cadets all throw their hats into the air, is that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this, this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter, so help me God. Now that's what every public official takes and every officer takes. It's not the same oath that an enlisted soldier takes. And frequently it's just part of the ceremony and we don't think about it, but it actually contains the kinds of things that are critical to a profession of getting that, at that practical knowledge. The focus of that oath is not, the enlisted oath includes that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the laws and regulations according to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. But an officer doesn't take that obligation. It's not that he's going to disobey the President or violate the regulations, but that the oath is to a higher calling, not to a king or a queen or a president, but to support and defend the Constitution. It, uh, officers are selected and commissioned because they have specialized expertise to make the decision within the profession of arms which is really the state has turned over to the military the application of violence on behalf of the nation. And the commission explains for every commissioned officer that there is a special trust and confidence in the patriotism, valor, fidelity, and abilities of each officer to use those abilities within that discretion that they're given. In the oath, officers take that obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. If you can't take that obligation freely without mental reservation or purpose of evasion, then you ought to resign your commission. And if you still have a military obligation, you serve as an enlisted soldier that doesn't take an obligation to serve freely. We saw that recently with the resignation of Secretary Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, where he could no longer 
take his obligation freely without mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And then finally, officers affirmatively state that they will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. This requires a specialized knowledge and training for that duties of the office. That's the theoretical knowledge so that those duties can be well and faithfully discharged. Officers have to act in unclear and uncertain situations where there aren't specific orders. The rule book is not already laid out. It's not clear exactly whether you take this hill or don't take this hill, protect these men, uh, don't protect those uh, soldiers over there. At times, they've got to serve in the best manner possible each time to support and defend the nations. The fact that officers' decisions may ultimately affect life and death reinforces the paramount importance of developing and maintaining specialized professional expertise. For officers, it's not just being proficient in a specific skill like flying an airplane or firing a weapon or operating a naval vessel. They've got to have the theoretical knowledge of business, of law, of behavioral science. And so that's why we put this context of the theoretical knowledge that Jeremy talked about into the broader abstract knowledge of the profession. And that's where officers grow in their professional wisdom. The essence of war fighting is engagement with a dynamic, uncertain enemy, and the study, discussion, and practice of warfare is responsible with the professional officer so that he or she is prepared to make those critical decisions. And that's important for officers of all specialties. So I would answer the question by kind of putting that theoretical knowledge of the classroom into the broader professional context and I think that may be helpful and interesting for you as you have the theoretical knowledge that you learn in the law classes here uh, and putting that in the broader uh, theoretical question as you enter the profession of law. With that, I'll turn it over to the lawyer on the uh, panel, uh, or the first of two lawyers on the panel, Colonel Reeves. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it really is a, an honor to be here this morning or this afternoon. I do have to make a special recognition of Dean Lisa Skank. She uh, was my professor at West Point and introduced me to both the law and the JAG Corps, and, and, but for her I would, I would probably be unemployed because I am from, what well, is not said in my bio is I am actually from Wyoming. Uh, and every time I talk, I have to let people know I am from Wyoming. And the last time I was in Washington, D.C., I was teaching uh, a group of lawyers, all military lawyers, a big group, uh, and they're, and I, I talked for four hours. And during my talk, I always talk about Wyoming consistently. And there was this guy sitting 15 feet from me. And what stood out to me about him is he had this huge mustache. That's like a Magnum PI mustache. And that's very rare in the military. I was like, that's an awesome mustache. And so I was making comments. He's making comments. I'm like, there's a connection. We're talking. Uh, and so at the end of the four hours, I, I uh, make some final formalities. And I get up and I walk to my car. And he's walking right next to me. So of course, you strike up conversation. I said. Hey, how are you? And he goes, I'm good. I'm like, where are you from? He goes, oh, I'm from Ohio. And he goes, where are you from? And I'm like, I just, I just spent four hours telling you I'm from Wyoming. I'm like, I'm from Wyoming. And he goes, oh, you must have a lot in common with that guy that was just up there. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> now, you will not remember me, but you will remember I'm from Wyoming. Um, but I do have to take a moment to talk about the Department of Law because a lot of what Mike just mentioned is relevant. Um, it's a bit strange that law is taught in an undergraduate institution. West Point is an undergraduate institution, but it's not as strange as you may think. Uh, law has been taught at West Point since 1818, though it was originally uh, taught in the uh, Geography, History, and Ethics Department. And some version of the course that Dean Skink taught me has been taught since 1823, and it's called the Constitutional Military Law Course. And we teach all, all the seniors at West Point take this course, and the course is broken into three parts. The first part is on the Constitution. Why? As Mike just pointed out, the oath that, uh, that these officers uh, take um, is to the Constitution, so they need to know something about the document that they're swearing an oath to. The second part of the course is focused on military justice. I tell the cadets, hey, don't be surprised by this, but the soldiers like to do, like get into bar fights, right? And they, they sometimes go AWOL. So you need some way to maintain good order and discipline in the military, and you do that through military justice. So we put a heavy emphasis on military justice. And then the third part is on the, uh, the law of armed conflict with a special emphasis on the use in bellow, uh, because there's probably no more relevant body of law for a, uh, a new officer than the in bellow when they deploy. And so uh, and I'm happy to talk all about that, but, but it's, it's interesting because we don't just teach this course to all the, all, the, all the seniors, but we also have a law and legal studies program. There's approximately 60 undergraduate institutions that have 
some variant of a, of a major in law and legal studies. Uh, and the cadets that major in law are not so much looking to become lawyers, though, though a lot of them will become JAGs or have a taken interest in law, because law or law school is almost the natural progression in leadership schools, if you think about it. But we do it more to help them gain the critical thinking skills that are necessary for, uh, to, to be successful on the, on the complex and, and uh, battlefield. Um, and the modern and contemporary battlefield is a real gray zone. And so we try to create, create critical thinking and take them away from binary thinking uh, by teaching them a number of courses. And the courses range from, you can guess them, national security and international law and criminal law and law of armed conflict, uh, cyber law. There's a number of different courses they take. And approximately 50 cadets will major in law each year. So I can talk more about that in the Q&A, but it really ties into Mike's comments. I want to take a second to just discuss the Department of Law. Now, I have been asked to talk about law and leadership, um, and, and really those qualities that are necessary for being uh, a successful legal advisor, and I, uh, of course, take this from the perspective of a military lawyer or a military legal advisor. Um, in this regard, it's important to understand a few basic assumptions uh, that, a, that a military lawyer uh, um, agrees with that there, the law has a strategic role in all of our all of our military operations. Um, number one, the law contributes to national security. I think we'd all agree with that. Number two, uh, the law reflects the ethics um, and values of our nation. Number three is that the law supports the rule of law, which um, is is important for our military. And fourth, the strategic consequences of a legal transgression can be um, catastrophic. And so as the legal advisor, it's our, our job to make sure that those four basic principles are adhered to. And so let me give you an example of how this plays out. The strategic, uh, or the, the uh, standing rules of engagement, the ESRO, um, are those rules that uh, basically regulate what, how the, how, use of, how the force is gonna be, or how force is gonna be used in a combat environment. Um, and those are, the standing rules of engagement are directives that are issued by, uh, by our national leaders to our military commanders and then subsequently to our, to our soldiers that delineate the, the, the circumstances in which they can use force. So the way that we regulate hostilities is through the standing rules of engagement. The, the ESRO, as it's called, is an amalgamation of both policy and international law, but underlying all of it is the UCMJ. So you violate the standing rules of engagement, you maybe have not committed a war crime, or you may not have committed a, a low act violation, but you have violated the UCMJ because Article 92 of the UCMJ requires uh, soldiers and officers to, to obey certain orders. And so the standing rules of engagement um, are a standing order on how we regulate hostilities. And but again, it has both our policy restrictions and our legal restrictions. And I use this as an example to highlight that underlying all of our military operations is the law. Uh, and the law is is how we set our left and right limits on what we can and can't do when we conduct hostilities. Um, and therefore, the role of the legal advisor in this environment uh, is critical to the strategic, operational, and tactical success of our, of our uh, forces. And so when I was thinking about this, I'm like, okay, really when you are the legal advisor, you really want to break it down into four different roles. The first is you're an advocate. You're not, don't think of it as advocating as like, I'm a cheerleader for the command or I'm going to do whatever the command says. I'm an independent, uh, uh, I'm independent in my thought. I, I, I apply the law in an impartial and objective manner to a situation. But when the command takes a, a, uh, a legally defensible position, that's when I become the advocate. Or in the alternative, I'm an advocate when I believe the, the command can take a better alternative and I need to convince the command that perhaps there's a better course of action that's, that's uh, available. So again, I'm an, number one, I'm an advocate. Number two, I'm a judge. Now, don't think of it as um, I, what I say goes. I am an advisor to the command. So if Colonel Spain is the commander, I advise the commander, and, and he can say, thank you, judge, but I'm not going to uh, take your advice on this, on this one. Um, but I am the authority on the law. Uh, and so I can say, you know what, sir, that's fine. I'm standing on your desk right now saying, uh, here, sign this memo so it exonerates me. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. But, but basically, hey, uh, I'm telling you this is what the law says. Um, and I am the authority on the law, and therefore I act in, a, in, a, in, in that capacity as, as a legal advisor. The third is I'm a counselor. Um, I need to help facilitate and enable the command to accomplish uh, his or her goals within the law. Uh, that means I have to be involved often and early in the operational decision-making process. I am not 
Don't think of me as, as a legal advisor who sits in a corner and once the plan is complete, it's given to me, I review it in a vacuum and I'm a rubber stamp. I need to be involved uh, all the way through in counseling the command and the staff on how we or should do things. And then finally, I, I, when I think of it, we're the conscience of the command. Um, it's not that it's, again, uh, the, the lawyer saying yes or no, but rather um, it's the, the, you have to be able to explain to the command, hey, there are alternatives that can be taken. This might not be a good idea. Maybe we shouldn't use this particular weapon in this situation. Maybe, maybe yes, you can under the law target this individual, but maybe it's a bad idea to do so. Right? Maybe there's other things we should consider. And so when you take into account those four um, roles of the legal advisor in the military environment, advocate, counselor, judge, and conscience, and you, you amalgamate those, you start to think of it as, hey, the, the lawyer is a consigliere. Not a consigliere like Robert Duvall in The Godfather, right? But, but more of this, this trusted, I guess Robert Duvall was a trusted colleague, but not an illegal, right? You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't help with the, any type of uh, illegal activity, but basically a trusted colleague to the command who, who both gives advice on the law, but also gives um, some judgment. Um, so. I'll leave it at that, and I'm sure we'll get into the Q&A, but the question that should be asked, this is what you should be asking me. Well, awesome, so how, can you teach that? That's, that's a great question, because some of it you can teach. You can teach critical thinking, you can teach competence, you can teach knowledge of the law, you can teach effective communication, but can you teach judgment? Can you teach the art, right, the art of, of advising? That, I, I think, is very difficult, and oftentimes comes through experience, which is oftentimes dismissed in this age of, of I can get information at the, at the tip of my fingertips. And experience is oftentimes dismissed as passe, but I think that's actually how you develop the art of, of advocating in those various roles I just laid out. And, and then during the q and I can give you some, some practical tips on, I think, how you can gain that, that experience. So I will turn it over to Ron. Ron. Okay, thank you, sir. First, I, I would like to extend my thanks to uh, Jeremy and to Dean Skank uh, for their generous inv invitation to me to speak here today. You know, I've been back to the law school a couple of times since graduation. Usually it's been in the summer when the nervous energy of law students is sort of at an ebb. Um, but I went, to, uh, um, I went for a walk this morning around the law school, around Foggy Bottom, just to see what's new, if anything's changed. And the one thing that actually struck me was how much parking was available out front, in front of the law school. <laughs> when I was a law student here, it was impossible to find parking out there. So um, it was either a function of the time I happened to be going for a walk, or maybe you, you're all very lucky. But very hard to find parking. Um, Colonel Reeves spoke a little bit about the uh, leadership qualities it takes uh, to be a good legal advisor. And I certainly agree that it's very important to serve as an honest broker, to serve as a trusted agent of the command. The aspect of leadership that I would like to highlight, and I think that's, it's a, an aspect of leadership that's kind of gaining um, greater uh, emphasis these days, especially with the rise of emerging technologies, things like autonomous weapon systems, and things like um, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, the aspect of leadership I would like to focus on is accountability. Uh, President uh, Truman famously had a sign that he kept on his desk. Does anyone know what that sign said? Right, exactly, the buck stops here. Now, President Truman uh, expounded on that idea that the buck stops here in a speech to the National War College in 1952, and here's what he said. He said, you know, it's easy for the Monday morning quarterback to say what the coach should have done after the game is over. But when the decision is up before you, and on my desk I have a motto that says the buck stops here, the decision has to be made. Good, willings, uh, good leaders must be willing to accept responsibility, and they must be willing to uh, be held accountable when things go wrong, especially uh, for commanders when things go wrong on the battlefield. As emerging technologies such as autonomous weapon systems, or AWS, and artificial intelligence, also known as AI, as they expand the distance between the decision maker and the consequences of decisions, it becomes even more important for leaders to hold themselves accountable and to acknowledge the responsibility that they have when things go wrong on the battlefield. A year and a half ago, the Lever Institute for Law and Land Warfare at West Point um, held a workshop, and the issue that we examined was the impact of emerging technologies on the law of armed conflict. As many of you know, much of the debate concerning emerging technologies, and again, in particular, autonomous weapon systems and artificial intelligence, 
um, and other emerging technologies is the focus on whether or not these systems can actually comply with important principles of the law of armed conflict, in particular, distinction and proportionality. With regard to distinction, are emerging technologies really capable of distinguishing between combatants and civilians on the one hand, and between military objectives and civilian objects on the other hand? Additionally, are these technologies truly capable of determining whether or not uh, the very important principle of proportionality has been met under the law of armed conflict? So in other words, are they capable of determining whether or not uh, civilian casualties or damage to civilian objects is excessive in relation to the direct and concrete military advantage expected to be gained from an attack. A number of groups have, adv have advocated uh, for a complete ban on certain emerging technologies, in particular uh, <coughs> autonomous weapon systems, also commonly known as killer robots. Um, these groups urge that autonomous weapon systems are, um, I'll quote here from uh, Human Rights Watch, they, they say that these uh, systems increase the risk of death or injury to civilians during armed conflict and would be inconsistent with international humanitarian law. Several leading scholars, however, uh, have pointed out that these calls for a complete ban on autonomous systems uh, actually blurs the distinction between international humanitarian laws uh, per, per se a prohibition on weapons and the prohibition on the unlawful use of weapons. So in other words, just because a, law, a weapon could be used unlawfully doesn't mean that the weapon itself is unlawful and therefore should be banned. Um, while it appears uh, clear to me that autonomous weapon systems are not per se illegal under international law, it's also clear to me that autonomous weapon systems could be used as an excuse to avoid making hard decisions and to dodge responsibility when things go wrong on the battlefield. As autonomous weapon systems become more adept at identifying, uh, targeting, and destroying military objectives, it may become more tempting to let these systems make the difficult decisions for us. Uh, for example, if we're not sure whether a building is really a lawful target, whether a, a civilian building or a building is being used as a military headquarters, for example, and is therefore a lawful target, well, why not let the autonomous weapon system decide? After all, it has the requisite sensors and cameras and algorithms to make a better decision than the human, right? Well, the temptation to advocate this responsibility, I think, should send up red flags. And good leaders understand that the buck stops with them. Deciding what weapons to employ and when to employ them is something that commanders have struggled with since time immemorial. And advancements in technology won't make those decisions any easier. Ultimately, these are life and death decisions, and fighting the wars of the future will and should require leaders to be held accountable for their actions. Now, I guess the next follow-up question would be, how do we teach this idea of responsibility and accountability to cadets? Well, we do it in, in a number of ways. One very simple way is to have them show up at formation every day, multiple times a day. They, they are at accountability formation at 6.30 in the morning, again at lunch, and then again for dinner. Um, does anyone know how we actually take attendance, for example, uh, at West Point in a class? Anyone know how that works? Well, we have a section where, yeah? I think yes, but No, not. Some schools have that Okay, that, that's, a good, that's a good idea. We might implement that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little different, though. Well, it's interesting because we have something called a section marcher who's in charge of taking attendance for you in class. So when class starts at 9.30 and suddenly the clock hits 9.30, suddenly the entire class stands at attention, your section marcher gives you the attendance, uh, sir, ma'am, um, all cadets present, or sir, ma'am, um, cadet so-and-so is absent. Again, very minor way of stressing the importance of accountability, of being in the right place, of being responsible for yourself, being in the right place at the right time, and in the right uniform. And then, of course, um, Colonel Reeves and, and General Meese talked about the oath that every cadet takes to the Constitution. Again, that's the whole, one of the whole reasons why we teach constitutional and military law to cadets. Because again, when they become officers, they need to understand what it is that they're taking an oath to, to defend. They have to understand those principles that are embedded in the Constitution. 
Um, and it's very important for them to, to realize how important that oath is and the meaning of it. But I'll, I'll leave it at that for the moment. I know Colonel Spain is going to talk a little bit more in depth about the West Point Leadership Development Model, and I'll be happy to take questions after, uh, after his remarks. Sir. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> So um, I'd like to do a quick roll call. That's an military formation right now. Um, any uh, L1s for shield law students here? Awesome, awesome. How about L2s? Great. L3s? Awesome. What's your master's? LLM. LLMs? Great. Uh, faculty at the school of law. Uh, staff members and teammates at school law. Any students of other George Washington schools here? Or any undergrads? Okay, awesome. Pleasure to be with you all. You know, thank you for letting me and our, my other colleagues share a little bit in uh, being part of George Washington for the day. It's very special to me. Um, there was, when I was a plebe at West Point, one of the things they do, this is 32 years ago, one of the things they did back then is it made you stand guard duty and you were guarding against you weren't really sure at the time, but you were just guarding. And so they had one Friday night, really tired after a long week, they put me in a corner and had me guard this, this door in the stairwell so no one could get into the barracks. Um, and a cadet might want to sneak their girlfriend in, but that's about the worst thing you were going to guard against. And uh, so I was sitting there, I was cold, I was tired, but I was trying to do my duty. It was teaching you your duty. And I had two upper class cadets stop by. And uh, one of their names was um, Nate Allen. The other name was Tony Burgess. And they uh, stopped and they took an interest in me, very different than most upperclassmen have interest in plebes or fourth class cadets or freshmen. And they asked me, you know, what was most important to me in life? And they wanted to get to know me a little bit and they basically offered to be my mentor. Just out of nowhere. That's the opposite experience of what happens at West Point. <laughs> Just the opposite. And, uh, and they're still my dearest friends today, 35 years later. But, but you know, Tony, Tony Burgess got his doctorate of science from the engineering school at George Washington University. His friend, Nate Allen, the other part of that equation, got his PhD in business from George Washington School of Business. And in my department at West Point that I'm privileged to be a part of, we had a young lady named Christina Fenizzi, who was one of our best teachers a couple years ago. She's a major in the Army, distinguished service in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, now she's a White House fellow on the National Economic Council, but she's an undergrad in the George Washington University. And right now in my department, one of my best teachers is named Ben Adams, and he's an infantryman. He carries a knife in his teeth. And on his right arm, he has tattoo in Latin. I said, Ben, was that tattoo? And it's full size. His whole arm is tattooed. And it says, sir, it said service. That's what it means in Latin, service. We're here to serve. So if you think about leadership from those, those perspectives I gave you, two folks went above and beyond to develop some, someone they didn't have to and mentor someone they didn't have to. Someone that tattoos on their arm a dedication to an ideal bigger than himself of serving other people. You know, and, a, and a young lady deployed several times into war zones and now serves our country in the National Economic Council. That's leadership, and that's George Washington University. So thanks for letting me be a small part of it today. So, team, I'm a, I'm a professor, and I grade things occasionally, right? And I grade papers. And sometimes students aren't happy with their grades. So uh, let me tell you a story briefly about three students, Morgan, um, Logan, and Shannon. So they all came in to see me after I asked them to do a leadership philosophy paper. And they wanted me to check their grade. They were unhappy with something. And it turns out they were unhappy with the same thing. It was the same critique of each of their papers by chance. They didn't work together. And they come in one after the other, and, and Morgan says, uh, Colonel, I think I, I think I did what the rubric says I should do. I should have gotten an A. And I'm like, well, you didn't show mastery. Yeah, you did what, it, what you did, but you, you didn't show mastery, and the Army officer needs to show mastery, and that's what you're trained to be, not just okay. And he went back and forth for a while, and then um, we determined, hey, we're just going to disagree. And, but he came in, I gave him a couple points for his efforts, and sent him on his way. But he's really interested in raising his grade, because that's what he thought he deserved. So then Logan comes in, and Logan says the same, the same issues, but I could tell that Logan was disappointed because I'd given him or her a C. And Logan was thinking, he or she disappointed me. And they wanted to show me that they understood what the concepts were, that their paper wasn't really their best effort, it really wasn't them. And they were disappointed. And I thought that was pretty neat. But I gave them a few points and moved them on their way. They still didn't show mastery. Third person didn't show mastery either. Shannon comes in the room. 
And Shannon, though, was disappointed that maybe he didn't understand something that he needed to have the understanding of to be a great officer later. It was the same mistake as the other two made. But he was worried that maybe he wasn't going to be able to apply it just right a couple years later when it really mattered versus on the paper. So same problem, three people. Morgan wanted the points. Logan wanted my approval. And Shannon wanted to understand how to serve others with that information better. But the exact same problem, exact same mistake. So those are three examples of the leadership, undergirding leadership and moral philosophy we use at West Point. Those are three examples. We, we call it Keegan's, Robert Keegan's uh, adult development model. Keegan stage two is when someone is interested in transactions to better their own situation. Now that doesn't mean they're mean or selfish in any way. That means that everything they're really working is to return to themselves someday in some way. And we all know like people like that. Some of us, we're like that a little bit too. The second person was Keegan stage three. And that is they're seeking, they'll put their own, their own priorities on hold to seek other people's approval. And when you're around other people with good values, that's usually a good thing, right? Because if I'm seeking the approval, let's say a brother or sister parent role model, that's a good thing you're seeking approval for. So that's usually a good thing. But not always. Keegan stage four is represented by the final student, who's Shannon. And that is someone that is living their life according to an external set of values as their main motivator. Remember what Logan wanted. Logan wanted to figure out what he or she didn't know so they could better be a leader in the future for the same problem. So at West Point, we get people that are phase two. It shows that people that come into high school, all of us, are really phase two. Even though we're good young men and women, our main priority is transactional for ourselves. But we want this character progression from character two to character three, which means I'm putting other people before myself. But that's still dangerous because occasionally a group can get off the rails and develop some dysfunctional norms and values. And if you're a Keegan phase three in one of these unique situations with poor organizational values or subgroup values, you're in trouble because you'll play along and contribute to poor choices. We really need Keegan four, and that's when the leaders are subjugated their self and their approval of others, which are very important things to all of us, to an external set of values. In the Army, we want that to be the seven Army core values, which are loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And at West Point, sometimes we refer to them as duty, honor, country in a similar way. So to, this is about a leadership forum, and the Army defines leadership this way. I'm going to abbreviate it a little bit but influencing people to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. Influencing people to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. So there's a great social psychologist named Richard Hackman at the Harvard, uh, he, he passed away a few years ago, but he was at the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and he added a couple things to the Army's definition. He said, I like that part, influence people to accomplish a mission or a goal and improve the organization. He added two things. He said, I also think a leader improves the people in addition to the organization, improves the people, and a fourth thing, and leaves the people more satisfied. Another person you may have heard define leadership is John Maxwell. Writes a lot of books, holds a lot of seminars, very well read, heard. He defines leadership with one word, and that's influence. That's influence. And the fourth theory that's really interesting, our definition of leadership, is by a guy named Ron Heifetz. He teaches out of the Harvard Kennedy School. He says what I think is maybe the most interesting so far, and that is leadership is mo mobilizing others to solve adaptive challenges. And adaptive challenges is something that's not routine. It hasn't been done before. It's a complex problem. So if you notice, all four of these definitions are interesting, and all of them have interesting nuance, important. But none of them directly go after character, do they? And that's what West Point is all about, developing leaders of character. And that's what I encourage George Washington Law School is probably about too, frankly. Because you want to be leaders that make the world a better place, as do we. As do we. So what, so what do we mean when we say character, I think, is very important. So the five facets of character are very helpful for me to understand. And I'm going to share those with you briefly, and then we'll get to the questions. So the five facets of character are moral character, civic character, social character, performance character, and leadership character. Well, let me talk about each one of those briefly. So moral character is what we're used to. We hear the word character just flat by itself without any context. That's honor, integrity, personal courage. Just do the right thing. Okay? Um, do not tell a lie. Moral character. Civic character. This one's really interesting. 
When you walk by that piece of trash on the sidewalk, do you, do you pick it up, even though it's not your piece of trash? Do you vote? Do you volunteer? Do you raise your hand? Do you help others when there's nothing they can give you in return? Do you help your community on your own with no, nothing back to you? That's civic character. We try to, we know that's an important part as well. What about social character, third, third component, or third facet? Social characters are being the same person 24 hours a day. Especially important to us at West Point because we have the different abilities to assume different identities, especially with social media. But we don't even need that technology. People had different identities before social media. You know, people in my generation were mean to some people and kind to other groups, right? We want to be the same character person 24 hours a day. Performance character is the fourth facet, and that's one that you hear sports coaches use a lot. They'll talk after a basketball game. You know, put the mic in the coach's face, and everybody's either happy. Well, it's just the winning coach this time. Hey, great game, coach. Any comments for the, for the viewers at home? And they always say, well, my girls played with great character. They stuck with it till the end. Well, they're on to something, right? They're not talking about moral character, but they're still on to something. They're, they're on to grit, resilience, hardiness, not quitting when faced with obstacles, right? That's an important part of character. So those four parts of character pretty much wrap it up, but not good enough for West Pointers. Because not only do we expect a West Pointer to display great character in their own life, but we also expect them to positively influence the character of others. So leadership character is you must influence others in a positive way. So if you see a group of people being abused by others, you need to step in if you're West Point character, leader of character. You should be developing the character of those around you if you have leadership character. So once again, five facets of character, moral, civic, social, performance, and leadership. And to be a leader of character is what we need at West Point and George Washington University. Hopefully you can live those out in your day-to-day -day life. So thank you. Terrific. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to uh, each of you. Again, those are uh, very rich uh, opening comments. Um, We've got a good chunk of time for questions and answers, so uh, without more, let's uh, turn it over to you. I, I know that uh, our panelists were eager to have a dialogue uh, for this discussion. Don't all ask questions at once. What qualities do you think uh, have overlapped uh, in your experience in the military along with uh, the skills that uh, you view as being most like uh, most relevant? Did everyone hear that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it, what qualities. Uh, have we seen that have overlapped the military profession and the legal profession? Right, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I think there are quite a, a number of qualities, and um, Colonel Reeves touched on it a little bit when he talked about the importance of being a, a good legal advisor. Um, one of them clearly is clarity of thinking. First of all, you have, a, you have to have expertise in your subject matter, because you really can't provide good legal advice unless you actually understand the, the laws that you're supposed to be advising on or the regulations. But beyond that, you know, being transparent is very important. Um, when you are a trusted agent, when you are a, an honest broker to the commander, you have to show the commander how you came to, uh, to a, um, a conclusion or how you've come to a conclusion. You can't hide the ball on those things. So you can say, well, you know, ma'am, um, I think that uh, you can do this, but, and Colonel Reeves touches on this a little bit. You know, legally you can do this, but on the other hand, this may not make sense as a policy matter. But you set that out clearly. There's, there's a legal requirement and there's a policy consideration here. Uh, so being transparent about your advice is, I think is very important. Um, being a, you know, a subject matter expert in, in the law is obviously very important. Um, other things you can think of, sir? Uh, there's, there's definitely some universal. Uh, uh, virtues, I'd say, or traits that translate from the military to civilian legal practice um, and, some, and some items. I think transparency is a big one. I think recognizing your role uh, and understanding that uh, what you say doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end of the, of the discussion. 
Um, I think, you know, you've heard the old adage, be prompt, be fast, be brief, be gone. I think that's completely accurate. Uh, you know, oftentimes as lawyers, we like to expound, right? We, like, we think everybody likes to hear us. It's just not true. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I tell the cadets this a lot. When the cadet says, well, in my opinion, I'm like, hold up, no one cares. Right? <laughs> Nobody cares what your, no one cares what my opinion is. No one really cares what your, but if you want to back it up with something substantive and say, well, the law would, would say this, and I think that is, that is something that's universal. Um, and I think also a few other things are just some, some very practical things. Uh, recognize that being a lawyer, whether you're in the military or in civilian practice, it's a people's business. And, uh, and you have to move away from the desk. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a real growing trend to, of, uh, of an unwillingness to interact face-to-face, -to, -face, um, to talk. It's email, tech, whatever it is. It's, that's, a, that's bad. I, it, it's the most effective thing to do is walk, get up, walk over, and talk to somebody. Um, and by the way, just from a practical, you know, um, practical tip, you're more likely to get what you want that way too. So, um, uh, and then I think the last one is, oftentimes it is a real flaw. Again, this is this is universal. I don't think it has anything to do with being a military or being a civilian. I just think it's being a lawyer. We oftentimes, as lawyers, like to highlight an issue, right? That's what we're good at. That's what we're, you're taught, is to go to pick an issue. Uh, but that's not, what the, that's not what your commander or whoever you're advising needs. They need solutions. So you need to be like, here's a problem, here's an issue, now here's another way to think about it. That's where you really bring some value. If you can, if you can bring a potential solution, an alternative idea, and I'm not saying just get to yes. There can be situations when you can't. But, but oftentimes, and I think this is um, a trait of a, of a junior attorney, is very conservative in your thought process. Like, no, we can't do that. I don't want to get close, close to the line. But it's not as helpful as saying, well, we can't do it this way, but here is a possible way to do this. So, And, and sort of on that point, too, um, I, I think it's also important to have the courage and the fortitude to, to, to give good advice, even though you know the commander may not be willing to hear it. Um, I was on an exercise up in... Um, uh, in Europe, and um, they were planning an operation, uh, it, again, exercise, planning an operation, and uh, throughout the process, I kept saying, I don't, I, really, I don't think you can do that, that's, that's not, that doesn't comply, that's outside the scope of international, etc. cetera. Uh, finally, the, the planners um, said, okay, uh, thanks, judge, um, we're gonna go ahead with this. Before they could launch their operation, they had to brief the commander. And the commander is listening, listening, says, okay, that sounds great, wonderful, wonderful, okay, great. Um, uh, Jag, uh, what do you think? And I said, sir? And I looked at the, he was a Romanian SEAL who was planning the operation. And he looks at me, I, I've never seen daggers come out of someone's <laughs> eyes, but they were coming out of his eyes. And I looked at him and I looked at the commander and I said, sir, I, I think there are serious problems. I have legal objection with this operation. And then he looked at, the commander looked at the, the SEAL and said, did you talk to Jag? And he said, yes, sir. And he said, what did he tell you? And he said, sir, he said, we couldn't do this. And he says, okay, well, we're not doing the operation. And from now on, I want everything to go through the judge advocate before it comes to me for a briefing. And you can imagine how I felt. I kind of shrank down into my chair. Um, but it was the right answer because not only, you know, maybe that operation would be successful, but in the long run, there would be serious consequences. And it was frankly illegal. Um, so you have to have that ability to, to stand up um, to say what's right when you think it's, it's what's right. In fact, Colonel Reeves and I were at the Pentagon just yesterday. We were talking with some senior um, leadership in the JAG Corps, and they were saying, you know, one of the things that he was telling us, one of the things that he tells his commanders when he first takes on the job is, you know, sir, ma'am, um, there are going to be two or three times uh, during my tenure here as your advisor where I'm just going to, I'm going to say, no, you can't do this. Oftentimes I will try to get you to the right answer, but there will be a couple of times where you cannot get to the right answer, and I will let you know. Um, and, and the example he was giving us was an example where you know it was absolute no um, on, on in terms of his advice. But I think that's important to realize. But it's also important to realize that you're going to need to stand up um, and take the right position, do what's right when when it comes to that. From the brief non-lawyer uh, uh, explanation of this, I think it's being able to figure out what you said, uh, Shane, getting to yes as being the right answer. Because the easy way to misinterpret what you were saying, Ron, is the easy way for the, an for the lawyer is to sit behind the computer and just say no. And the great lawyers that I've worked with, like the two of you, like Lisa, like Ren Gady, like Rich Gross, like Mark Martins, are the ones 
who didn't just take the easy answer and say, no, you can't do that because it might be somewhere near the line. It's here's the way to work at TS. There's another question in the back and, and then in the fourth row. You know, th thanks for that question. My my gut is that you'd be pretty pretty good, if not great, because you're asking yourself those questions. You know, being a, a reflective and self aware are, are wonderful traits for leadership. And I bet you're more than up to it, frankly. Um, and I encourage you to to seek those out. So, uh, the West Point Leader Development System is is undergirded with another philosophy in addition to Keegan's called the Leader Growth Model, and it basically says that all of us grow as leaders with the continuous cycle of three aspects. And, and this is no order, but one, the first thing to prepare if you were going to take a leadership role is perhaps to seek new knowledge. Uh, that can come in, the, in the, as mentors giving you feedback, lectures you're attending like perhaps like this, um, reading a book about leadership, learning about the position you're about to take in the context of that organization. That's new knowledge. And the second phase of a leader development model is challenging experiences. Put yourself somewhere outside of your comfort zone right at the edge of your capability, you know, bracketed with the right amount of support to balance off, offset that challenge. But you really want to stretch yourself to grow. And then the third phase after that experience, whether it's a few hours or a few months, is a period of reflection where you have folks coaching you perhaps on, hey, what went well? What's your name? Jenny. Jenny? Jenny, what did you do well? What went well for you this, this month in that role? And then Jenny, what didn't go well for you in this month? And why do you think those things that went well went well? Why do you think those things that didn't go well didn't go well? And that reflective exercise will anchor lessons learned. So now you're Jenny plus as a leader. And you re-enter the cycle with what new knowledge could I gain to take my leadership to the next level? How can I go and re-enter into leadership in maybe a more challenging way to keep growing? And then reflect on that again. And that continuous cycle is how all of us grow over time. The two areas that are the area that's most often overlooked of those three is the reflective phase. Right? So I had a class where we were talking about this yesterday with a bunch of Army captains, who most of them had deployed several times. And, and they, they thought that out of those three aspects, the experience is the most important by far. And they said, that's probably 80% of it. New knowledge is 5 or 10%. Reflection is 5 or 10%. This, I'm, an, I'm an old guy for the Army. And this old person's perspective is the reflection is about 80% of leader growth. So if you, and all you have to do is ask a mentor to care about you and to give you hard feedback regularly, right? You don't need to buy it. You don't have to buy a coach. That's fine, but you don't have to. All you have to do is seek reflect, and reflect on what happened to you, and you will grow. So thank you, Jenny. Look forward to seeing you successfully lead. The only, the only thing I would uh, piggyback on, on Everett's comment there is uh, it's okay to say you don't know uh, and, uh, and go find the answer. You're not expected to know everything. Now, you got to be quick. You got you to be like, I don't know, I'm going to get it, and then and shift your priorities to get the answer. Um, but it's all right to, you're not going to have complete knowledge on, on anything. And I think you would, you gain the trust of whoever you're advising if you admit that you're like, I'm not sure on that, but I'll find out. Um, and if you really, and then, and then it's very important to have this, this structure, both, both the mentors as well as a network of individuals who, who know what they're doing. My example would be when I worked at a, um, as a deputy legal advisor a Joint Special Operations Command, there was a lot of fiscal law issues. Uh, I am not a fiscal law guy, but I knew, I knew the people who were the fiscal law guys. And so I would say, I don't know. And by the way, I, I could barely hide that I didn't care either. I was like, I just don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't care. Um, but I knew it was important to the command, so I would be able to tap someone very quickly who I knew was a fiscal law expert and be like, hey, Darren, I need an answer to this. And he's like, yep, no problem. Now. You have to have a good network of individuals to be able to do that, um, and they have to trust you, and you have to trust them. So build that network, look at those mentors, and then be very quick to respond when you do admit that you don't know something. Terrific. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you to all the panel. My name is Elisa Ben. Last night, I really appreciate your insights and 
and updates. So in full disclosure, I was invited by a colleague who didn't know there was going to be all this amazing West Point representation. I'm a West Point alum and a lawyer post-military service. And my question um, for, I just love the fact that they're also you know, students, um, but also for my information, is where do you see the, or do you see um, any opportunities for what your, your focus is on the national security um, aspects um, with any of the commercial um, trades or industry? I know you talked a little bit about the uh, emerging technologies my, my background has been more on the commercial, excuse me, corporate side. So I was just curious if you see opportunities with that intersection of business and um, the areas of law that you're discussing today. Well, I'll just, I'll just start out by saying that um, I think one of the premises of this panel, uh, from my perspective, um, directing the business and finance law program, is that the, every aspect of leadership that uh, our uh, panelists have described is directly relevant to uh, commercial lawyers. Um, lawyers will be, as they, as lawyers get more uh, it, it, uh, senior, they will be called upon, there's no question that, that lawyers will be called upon to exercise leadership in the context of their law firms or their law departments. Uh, um, and as I uh, said earlier, there are all sorts of contexts in which society as a whole uh, has looked to and continues to look to lawyers who have a combination of expertise and broader judgment to perform broader roles. So I think uh, uh, all of this is, is relevant far beyond the, the military leadership context that uh, our, our panelists are beginning with. I think the uncertainties in the commercial environment are greater now than they probably have been at other times. It's easy to say that contemporary, but with um, whether it's internet, whether it's uh, uh, AI, whether it's uh, corporations that don't really have a legal basis of, of what country they're operating in, um, and clear-headed people establishing precedents and processes and systems that then the rest of society will follow because governments have not been able to catch up with those. Cyber is a great example where the precedents in cyber um, are really going to be set by the public sector uh, or the uh, private sector, private commercial sector long before they're going to be established by government because government can't catch up to that and uh, so consequently in a sense the kinds of things that I described about the military profession having to act in uncertain ways and then chart things out, increasingly that's going to be uh, a challenge for the commercial sector because there aren't any right or left limits and the government's going to be four or five years behind coming up with what those right and left limits are. Yeah, I, 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 that's a fascinating point. Um, it's a great question. Cyber is an interesting one. In particular, uh, if you look at how corporations, corporations are consistently uh, under attack. Uh, and attack is a term of art under the law of armed conflict, so I'm using it more broadly. But they're constantly uh, being hacked by state actors, primarily. Uh, and, the, and the corporations have looked to the government for answers, and they're very frustrated by the lack of a response by the government. And so a number of corporations have started to act almost like non-state actors in how they want to respond. And the law is, is, is malleable on cyber. Sovereignty is, is diminishing. Uh, how what is considered a response up to the use of force is a big question. I mean, there's all types of questions that come with cyber, uh, and we could go for a long time talking about this. But it is the it's the lawyers who are leading the way in the in the private in the private sector um, that are are establishing um, the parameters for for um, how cyber law is going to be uh, implemented in the in the private sector, and that that is starting to bleed over into the public sector. I think there's a second great example, which I find fascinating, is the Operation uh, Maven question that's happened at Google, where you've had a number of Google employees of approximately 3,000 who've signed a document saying, hey, don't do anything evil, stop, you know, Google, stop uh, participating in, in weapons development. Um, and that's, that's a naive approach, and I'm, I'm, I know there will probably be people that disagree with me, but it's not understanding the way weapon development um, happens. And, and Ron has, has talked a lot about emerging technologies. Uh, weapons 
technology gets into weapons no matter what. But uh, it has been a number of lawyers who have been trying to communicate to those employees, hey, there's a better way to do this. And the better way to do this is to try to get in front of the technology and, and help it in weapons development and therefore make these weapons more discriminatory, more capable of complying with these various principles under the law of armed conflict. So again, in the private sector, it's uh, on the national security uh, component of the private sector, the lawyers have taken the lead in, in showing how the law can, can effectuate change in a positive way. I want to pick up on uh, part of what you were talking about, Evan, and that is the progression from Keegan 2, 3, and 4. Are there, are there predictable and recognizable inflection points in an, in, in an individual journey? And if there are, how has West Point structured the Cadet experience to encourage the movement along that spectrum? Uh, thanks, Dr. Al. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Al Chase is a wonderful mentor for a lot of military officers around around the na the world, actually, the nation. But um, so uh, Brady, not only military officers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I worked with him uh, when I was at MIT. Awesome. Thank, thanks. Um, so a brief answer to a very complicated question, right? So um, Keegan Stage Two are most high schoolers, us really, and first year college students. And so the way to move someone from Keegan stage two to three, uh, there's a lot of levers, right, to pull in someone's development, but the two most uh, robust ones are to set and establish a, a, a culture of high standards, whatever those may be, just high standards, but you have to enforce them as a culture. And the second thing you have to do to get people to move from two to three is to give them role models, who are the stage three role models that are present and active in their lives. So set a culture of high standards, of how people act in this culture, and it's enforced, and then have a lot of role models present to move people from two to three. So the way we do that at West Point is, of course, you can imagine West Point's difficult. Their barracks have, every, their socks have to be laid out the same way. They have to be on class. Their hairs have to cut have to be like this. They can't turn on late homework. They can't come late for class. It's just a million things that are high standards, and they can all be tied to something, though you could laugh at some of them, I'm sure, about some value of how that could be important. But over time, that enforcement of high standards it makes a culture of I'm not going to let my colleague down, which transfers you to two to three. And I should act like this because they have these role models around them. And those role models are team leaders. Everyone at West Point, has a, every freshman has a sophomore put in response for them called a team leader. They're responsible for their health, welfare, and development. And it's a relative random assignment, about 1,000 team leaders or about 1,000 freshmen. Right, so those are stage three role models that are in there. I'm stage two role, stage three role models. now. So how do you go then, let's say that works, and we get people from stage two to three. Now we, uh, now we want to move them from three to four, because stage three, Keegan three is not good enough for a West Point officer. They're going to fail when the people around them are failing, right, morally. Um, the research says the way to go from three to four is to put people out of their comfort zone, and that typically means putting them around, a pe around people unlike themselves. Right, and requiring them to do things they weren't used to doing and putting them in morally complex situations. So we do that at West Point by sending people on what you call internships, we call AIDs, getting them all away from the military and with people of different values than themselves and having them reflect and learn and grow. We do exchange semesters and periods with other nations and other schools and get people away from their culture, right? And so, but that is much harder to do on a scale of a thousand people, right? to give a thousand individual experiences out of your comfort zone with people unlike yourself, when we're all like each other at West Point, you could argue, right? So we have, we have more of a challenge going from three to four, excuse me, from, yes, from phase three to four than we do from two to three. And as a result, a lot of West Pointers, though it's an aspirational goal to get to stage four, some of us take a little more time after we graduate to get all the way there. Thanks, Al. Uh, this is kind of like jumping onto my Uh, bad news never gets better with delay. Just transparency. Just be like, up, tra I, Ron brought up transparency. I think transparency and communication are the two keys. Be very quick and be like, hey, I made a mistake and own up to it and just uh, accept, the, accept responsibility for the consequences that come from it. But it's better than trying to, and then, and then obviously come back with, here is the right answer, here's the solution. But um, I mean, it's, it's a very, for me, it's a very simple answer. It is 
uh, complete transparency and, uh, and, and communicate, communicate, communicate. I think, I think most, uh, most problems in life are lack of communication. And so, and you'll find that if you've built up enough capital with whoever you're advising, uh, that they will, they will be hopefully forgiving. Um, but, uh, I mean, if the mistake's made, you have to own up to it. No, other thoughts? Yeah, um, it's the story, I, I don't know whether I'll get it right, the guy who took command of his company and in there, the guy, the outgoing person said, okay, when you foul something up, I've got three envelopes in the desk of what to do if you foul something up. And anytime you mess up, open up one of those envelopes, and that'll tell you what it is. So sure enough, first day, foul something up, opens up the first envelope, and he says, okay. He said, blame it on the previous person. Okay. So he explains, that, yeah, this mistake was all on the previous commander. Next day, foul something up, opens up the second one, follows what Shane says, admit it, you fouled up, take responsibility, I'm going to learn from that. And sure enough, the third day, you foul something else up, make three envelopes. Uh, so uh, I think the, the key is to make, uh, when you do make mistakes, own up to it and then learn from those mistakes. And that's where the development comes in. That's where the kinds of things that Everett talked about is you um, have to demonstrate that you're learning from that organization because frankly, most organizations that are succeeding if you're not making mistakes, you're not pushing the envelope hard enough or fast enough or most, more significant uh, enough, whether that's a military organization or a commercial firm or a governmental organization because you want to be achieving as, mo as much as you can and that will run into legal and potential moral and ethical constraints and that's where you'll turn to a trusted legal counselor to try to get to yes. Uh, to do those. I think, and that's, I just made me think about this. Uh, for you all, that one of, part of what Jeremy wants to talk about is what should you be looking at when, in 2030. So when you have those responsibilities, you have to be willing to underwrite risk for those that are subordinate to you um, if you want your organization to be great. Meaning they're going to make mistakes and, and accept that uh, up, up to a limit, right? And, uh, but don't, don't expect perfection. So, you know, the leadership isn't strict liability. It's not you make a mistake and you're done. So underwrite the risk of those below you also, um, if, if you trust them. Um, Henry Paris, uh, 1L at GW Law. Um, so kind of touching on point that Nathan Apollo was talking about, about a solution-based leadership approach. I was wondering what skills that you built in law school or the military to help you kind of um, create a solution-based leadership philosophy. He mentioned your name. He did. <laughs> <laughs> did you say Major Alton? No. Um, you know, law school, I think uh, Colonel Reeves kind of uh, touched on this point a little bit um, when he was talking about, you know, issue spying. So in, in law school, right, when we're, we're doing uh, an exam, in part, a lot of that uh, examination process is, is issue spotting, figuring out, oh, what's wrong with this? How, how can you fix that? What's wrong with this? And what Colonel Reeves was saying earlier was, that's not what you're, you should be doing to your commander. Your commander has a problem that he or she is trying to resolve. Um, and if you're going to just go through it and identify every tiny little problem for the commander and highlight it, that's not going to help you. That's not going to get the command to the response or, or action that it needs to take. So it's very important for you as the advisor trained in, 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 um, uh, as a leader to understand the commander's intent, what it is that the commander is trying to achieve, how to get the command to achieve that objective. Um, and yeah, definitely you're spotting all the issues, but how, as, as General Lee said, how do you get to yes? How do you help the command get to that yes? So we learn in law school to issue spot, to identify issues. That's not your role once you get out into the real world, at, at least at, um, as a, an advisor to a military command, you're not going to rehash all those problems that you're spotting. What you need to do is be able to synthesize all that, figure out what the commander's intent is, how do you get to yes on a particular issue. So I, I think that's one aspect of, of what you learn in, in law school that might be a little different in application in the real world. 
and you, you use the term solution-based leadership philosophy. I've not heard that, um, but what I think we would use in the military is a mission command or a mission-focused approach. And the way that you do that in a, as a leader is we use the term mission command where you identify what the mission is, and especially as you rise up in leadership levels, you focus on that, but it's really easy if you're a, especially a lawyer, you give the advice you, at, at that level, it would be very easy to sharpshoot or micromanage or get involved in all of the details. And what we find is that what they call mission command, you specify the mission and then you let the subordinates exceed your expectations and do all of the things that they need to do and, and trust and empower them like Shane talked about. And I think, um, I'm not sure if that's what solutions-based leadership philosophy would be, but it, that's how I would translate it in that is what we would call mission command where you're specifying a mission and then you're empowering the subordinates to accomplish that mission and you'll find out and usually they will achieve it even better than you would have thought they would have and that's where you can be especially proud of those sorts of organizations. Thank you, that's helpful. Final question. advantage of the military is we move jobs <laughs> so Clean you don't and, and frequently when you do move jobs and the past decisions don't follow you don't let them follow you in other words not covering them up but many people feel so guilty for the past decisions that they made that when they're in a new environment they are crushed by oh my gosh I'm gonna make another mistake I'm gonna make another error even though it's a completely new situation, and they end up uh, cowering. So, uh, as a leader and a person, you know, I'm a work in progress. You know, I make mistakes. I still do, right? I will tomorrow. It's just a reality. So, on an individual level, General Meese hit it on the head. On an organizational level, how do you set up a culture of character growth where it's okay to mess up and you do it regularly? If you're really pushing the envelope on something, you should be failing all the time, right? And if we get a culture where messing up is just normal, it's part of our growth process, then we're good. So uh, in this particular case, you, know, you might not have a culture of character growth, right? Um, but you still may be an organizational or positional leader. So I also like to say leadership is a team sport. So a great way to do that is get an ally, whoever the person is that perceived they made a mistake, get an ally to build with you, to build your legitimate power as you go back into that situation. And then work on different influence te techniques where you visit people one-on-one -on -one instead of in the group. And so they're more concentrated on your ideas versus whatever imperfection it was in your past. So that's just a couple of quick ideas. Thanks for that question. Well, uh, I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, do, do any of you have any final thoughts that you want to share? No? Uh, well, then it falls to me uh, on behalf of GW Law School, the Business and Finance Law Program, and uh, the National Security Law Program, and Dean's Gang to thank our panelists for a terrific panel.